I'd like to talk to you today about a call to obedience. We're going to be looking at what the King James Bible says on the subject of obedience. Uh, kind of interesting because obedience is actually a New Testament word. Uh, you would think the obedience sounds like you have to follow laws or rules or whatever, so that would have been in the Old Testament under the Mosaic Law. Um, well, actually, obedience is a New Testament doctrine found primarily in the Pauline epistles. Only one reference in Hebrews, one reference in First Peter, I think it is. Um, we aren't going to be, go be going over those. I'm going to focus mainly on the Pauline epistles. So take your King James Bible and go to the book of Romans. It's a very important study, especially nowadays, as we are entering into a time where of a lot of political uncertainty and a lot of rules that are coming out that go contrary to the Bible, People telling you to do things with your body, um, trying to usurp the authority that God has over your body. If you're saved, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. God tells you what to do with your body. No government official has a right to tell you what to do with your physical body. All right, um, that's one thing. Another thing is they say you can't go to work and provide for your, for your children and your wife and whatever if you're a man. You're supposed to stay at home. Don't worry, we'll send you checks. It's not how it works. That's a sin, according to Scripture. If any would not work, neither should he eat. You're supposed to work for a living as a man. All right, something very, very desperately wrong with being forced to stay at home by a government over something that is essentially like the flu. Some very satanic rules that are coming out. So I think it's a really good time to have a call to obedience. Not obedience of the government, but obedience to God. Let's look here. Romans chapter 1 we're going to begin in verse 3. It says here, Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience, that was the first time it appears in your King James Bible, to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom also are ye also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to remember the things that the Lord has called you to if you are saved. You aren't just, oh, okay, you're saved, all right, congratulations, you've been saved, go on about, do whatever you want with your life. Uh, you're bought with a price. God calls you to do certain things when He saves you. Okay, That's why salvation is not New Age intellectualism of I believe, therefore I am. I've gone from unbelief to belief. Those are satanic false gospels. All right? You have to call out to the Lord because you believe the gospel here, and you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. It's what the Bible plainly teaches. I mean, it's Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. It's just as you know, plain as the nose on your face. You call out, and the Lord saves you. We'll see that as we continue in this study. But what does he do here? For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. You are to be obedient to the faith. What is the faith? What's written about in this book? Are you obedient to the instructions God has given you? I mean, most people that profess to be Christians today don't even believe in the perfection of the book that they claim is God's word. Think about that. Well, this is God's Word. God's Word tells us today, is it perfect? Well, no, it's a translation. No translation is inspired. All translations have translation errors and problems. And What's the perfect Word of God? Well, the Greek and the Hebrew. What edition? What text? There are multiple Greek texts, multiple Hebrew texts. Which one is the perfect Word of God? Well, um, they all have copyist errors and, and areas where they could be clear, and we're always looking for new manuscripts which can, can undo what we previously thought were authoritative. And you say, well, then what's the standard? What's the perfect standard? The original autographs. The original autographs are the perfect Word of God. Where are they? They don't exist. They're in heaven. God caught them up to heaven. That's the stand of most modern Christians. That's why Christianity today, what is called... Christianity is a pathetic joke, an absolute pathetic joke. But if you're part of the church of the living God, the truly saved, born again, God's changed your life when you got saved. You come to him as a broken sinner, you call upon him to be saved because you believe the gospel and he saves you. 
That group right there, we know what the standard is. We aren't hypocrites like the others are. We believe the book that we hold in our hands, and we're supposed to be obedient to it. And you're not always going to be obedient to it. You know that. You know you've failed the Lord many times. I've failed the Lord many times. But you see, here's how it works. Every day is a new beginning. Every minute can be a new beginning if you pray and ask the Lord to forgive you. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's talking about a saved person. 1 John chapter 1. We are supposed to be obedient. God tells you what to do in His Word. Be, be obedient to the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Be obedient to what this book says for you to do. Why? It's a divinely inspired book. Are you going to obey it? Yes, Lord, I will. Well, what about that time there? Well, I'm sorry, Lord, I failed you. I'm, I'm, I can't believe I did that, Lord. I'm sorry. Please forgive me, Lord. I'm going to do better. I'll try to get better. Sanctification. Help me, Lord. I need to help have victory over the sin. See, that's Bible-believing Christianity. That's, that's what the Bible says we're supposed to be. When you're born again, there's supposed to be that change there. But look at verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God. You are beloved of God. Don't forget that. Well, there's lots of evil stuff that's on the horizon here that's, that's coming to America and other countries as well. But don't forget that you're beloved of God. That should give you some confidence to be bold in these days that are ahead. Called to be saints. Um, do saints, uh, when you think of a saint in your mind, do you think of somebody sitting in front of a television drinking a bunch of you know, alcohol or something and cussing and telling dirty jokes? Or is that the ad attitude and the way a, a saint is supposed to act? No, a saint would be obedient to the word. And I can't tell, me, tell you how many times I've heard professing Christians and they'll say, well, you know, I'm not a saint. I might not be a saint. Do you realize what you're saying? Hmm. Called to be saints. I'm not saying you have to be perfect when you first get saved. You're not going to be sinlessly perfect. You never will be sinlessly perfect. But there should be a, a changed life there that gets better and better. Why? Obedience to what's written. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God has grace. He calls you to obedience, but He has grace when you mess up if you confess your sins to Him. Don't confess your sins to me. I can't do anything, you know. Uh, you can lie to me. You can do all kinds of things. You know, I'm not the one you confess your sins to. Confess them to God and be obedient to Him. That's what this study is about. Turn next to Romans chapter 5. And a lot of preachers are just simply aren't going to preach this stuff because it, you know, can offend people and, and things. And, you know, again, the average church building today is filled with lost people. And you got to say things that don't step on their toes. You don't want to get too hard on their sins because then their tithe leaves and they eventually leave. Leave. You can't have that. You got to get that income and go on there and everything else. And you know why. Romans chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, Adam, in other words, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. You say, well, there you go, universal salvation. No, that's not what it's teaching there. <clears throat> it is not teaching that everybody's automatically saved. It's just simply saying salvation is available to anybody out there. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. Oh, that's of the elect. It doesn't say that. Okay, look at the verse. <clears throat> the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. It doesn't say one word about election. So Calvin uh, was a, a rather ridiculous, uh, lost philosopher. And I do believe he was lost. Verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Jesus Christ is given as an example for us. Paul says, be followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. You're supposed to remember that Jesus Christ, he had to die 
to pay for sins. Well, you're to take up your cross. You're supposed to crucify yourself. Your, your vile affections and lusts. You're supposed to put your flesh down. Why? Because that's obedience to God. I think we need obedience to God now. You see, if you fear God, you'll obey Him. If you fear man, you'll disobey God. Man, secular man, one of the most important things for them to do is to get you to disobey God. They want to intimidate you and get you to say, oh, well, I could lose my job and I could lose my standing and, and, and what if people thought that I was this and that? And oh. They want you to disobey God. You can't do it. You can't do it. Jesus Christ, you look at Him and you say, well, I can't be God like He was. But you know what? He got mocked. He was uh, spit on. His own countrymen tried to throw him off of a cliff. They tried to kill him. Hmm. He was ridiculed. Yeah. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6. Go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 19. We'll see the next time here that uh, obedience occurs. Romans chapter 6, verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield yourselves, or your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. I did a, a call to righteousness and a call to holiness you know, previously. You can watch those videos. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I'd, I just like to get drunk once in a while, Brother Brian. I don't, I don't do it a whole lot. I don't go to the bars like I used to go. But it's, I, I just like to get drunk once in a while and get a little bit high on, on drugs. Why? The end of those things is death. Why would you want to mess with that stuff? Well, I just like to look at porn once in a while because, you know, yeah, it just kind of, you know, lust gets built up and I, it's not going to kill me or, you know, whatever. Why? The end of those things is death. You want to defile your mind even more? You know? Uh, I, I'm just going to get and, and watch some television and play some video games and just, you know, eat a bunch of junk food that I know it's, I know it's toxic, but what are you doing? Why do you want to mess with that stuff? The end of those things is death. You sit down, you play video games for the rest of your life, it's going to lead to an early death. It's not making you healthy. Okay? <laughs> I, just, I just like to just kind of, you know, mess around a little bit. I don't get that. Uh, look at uh, verse, where are we at here? 17 through 19. Um <clears throat> Oh, okay, I'm looking at the next passage, 9 through 18. Uh, let's see, where did I stop? Romans chapter 6, verse 9 through 18. I went and lost my place now. Okay, I'll just go up to verse 12. Sorry about that, got off on a little bit of a rant. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye members, your, your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, there's that obey word, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. We're free from sin. That's, you know, when the Holy Ghost comes in, you know, before when you're lost, there's no Holy Spirit there to guide you. And, you, you know, when you get saved and you think back to stuff that you used to do as a lost person, you think, why did I do that? That was so stupid. Man, that was dumb. There was no Holy Spirit there to guide you. The Holy Spirit, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves in, and all of a sudden you go to touch it. Don't do that. Don't eat that. Don't drink that. 
Stop. Listen to him. I think the Lord knows a few things. Okay? Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Remember that. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glared therefore on your behalf, but yet I, wish, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. We'll get a hold of that one. Your obedience is come abroad unto all men. Did you know that the lost world looks at you and watches you when you claim to be a Christian, when you claim that you're saved? They're going to look at your obedience or lack thereof. If you're a poor, rotten example as a Christian, um, they're going to see that. They're going to see the hypocrisy. They will. But if you're obedient, sorry, I don't mess with that stuff anymore. I don't listen to that kind of music. I don't appreciate that. I don't, I don't appreciate the joke that you just told I don't, I don't really have anything to do with this voting stuff. It's a scam anyways, and I this and I that. Why? Because I obey the Bible. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity, like the old hymn says. Things have changed. I'm obedient to God. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. You're supposed to understand the difference. There's supposed to be separation in your life so that you can obey the things that are good and do what the Lord tells you to do and say, I'm not doing that other stuff. That stuff's bad. That stuff's wicked. I'm not going to do that. You're to be separate from the world. I think we need a call to obedience. With the, within the body of Christ. Not messing around with the flesh. Not messing around with sin all the time. Oh, just a little bit doesn't hurt. Oh, it's okay to do a little bit. I can just kind of have a little fun once in a while. It doesn't hurt if you look. You know, come on. You're not obedient. We're supposed to be different than the lost world. Jump down to verse 25. We'll see the next reference to obedience here. Uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, see it there again, obedience of faith, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. There's supposed to be obedience connected to your faith. I have faith in Jesus. I put my belief in Jesus. I believe the gospel. And so therefore I have faith. What about obedience? Obedience of faith. Do you have obedience of faith? What are you obeying? Well, I have to obey the sacraments and die in a state of grace in order to possibly maybe get through purgatory and eventually get to heaven so I can sit there on Mary's lap or something. Uh, no. No, that's not obedience. That's not biblical obedience. That's papal obedience. Obeisance, you know, another way to say, it. you know, doing works for the Catholic Church. Um, no. What is biblical obedience? Do you have faith, do you? You're genuinely born again? Do you obey the book? Do people uh, around you, do they know that you obey the book? Do they know that there's something different about you? Hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We'll see the next reference to obedience. Let your women... 1 Corinthians 14 verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience. As also saith the law, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. 
Boy, how many church buildings violate that one? Can't tell you how many times I've seen that. That doesn't mean that the woman's supposed to be mute and she's just supposed to walk in and just... And somebody says, oh, hi, sister, so-and-so. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. It's just simply saying when the men are up there and they're, and they're the elders of the church and they're saying, okay, we need to have some some things here and a hey, brother so-and-so how's it going over there with your ministry work and and um, brother this and brother that the men are supposed to be doing the speaking the men are supposed to be the ones that are opening up the word and teaching from the word and the women are to keep silent what about when you sing the women are supposed to just be silent no women can sing that's totally fine and you know a woman out in public or whatever else she can get into a, a witnessing situation aquila and priscilla did that um, she was, you know, Priscilla there, uh, she certainly spoke to, uh, you know, different people and things, I believe. But in, when you get together as the church, when the church comes together, it's supposed to be a organized meeting where the elders of the church, the men are the ones that are talking and the women are commanded to be in obedience. Be quiet, please. If you have some questions, write them down and ask your husband when you get home. How many churches do that? And I've heard some of these Catholic churches, you know, and the women are screaming and shouting amen and whatever else. And they say, well, you know, I've, I've heard them, people try to skirt the Bible in so many ways, it cracks me up. But I've heard women and they'll, and they'll scream, just go, ah, you know, or something like that. Well, she didn't talk, she just screamed. <laughs> you just think, oh, come on, you know, please give me a break. Um, that's disobedience. Be quiet. Shh. I mean, look at look at what the verse says there. Let your women keep silence in the churches. Well, that just means that they're not allowed to talk. They can scream if they want to, but they're just not supposed to talk. Now, silence means silence. Well, I'm a modern, empowered woman. I'm just as good as a man. I can do anything that a man can do. I am better than a man in some ways and, and whatever. And I will not submit myself to such chauvinistic, uh, you know, horrible rules. Okay, then you're not saved. You're not saved. Obedience. Feminism is a satanic thing. It's witchcraft. Well, I'm, I'm a Christian feminist. I've, I've actually heard that. I'm a Christian feminist. Oh, no, you're lost. Turn next to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. There's no such thing as a Christian feminist. Okay? It doesn't work. Feminism rejects the, you know, the the thing of male authority and, and God being a father. They try to make God into a woman. Um, there's nothing uh, feminine about God. Okay. You know, if you're a woman, that's, that's a beautiful thing. You look at God and you say he's a father. He's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to have a man to protect you. Something's a little bit messed up in the old noggin up here if you think that you're a woman and you don't want a man's protection. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15 through 16. The next reference to obedience. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. He's talking here about uh, Timothy, I believe it is, that he sent, or no, Titus. Verse 14 talks about Titus. Um, you know, and he's saying about you've received him and whatever else, and, and Paul's hearing about their obedience. So he's saying you're you're doing good here, but you're just stabbing me in the back, essentially, when you get to Second Corinthians, get the feel of this in through here. There are false prophets coming trying to mess up the Corinthians. And uh I've seen that plenty of times in my own ministry, people trying to mess up uh, those that follow this ministry and learn from this ministry. Um Again, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. How can I have confidence in you if I see that you're not obeying the Scriptures? I've preached to you, I've taught you, and yet you're not obeying the Scriptures. It's not about obeying me and being a good Denlingerite or something. No, you obey the Scriptures. And when you do, I have confidence in you. I can recommend you. I hear, hey, brother or sister, you know, so-and-so out there, they're, they're doing a good thing. They've really changed their life. I've, I've been able to talk to them and, and whatever else. I can have confidence that I can send somebody to you. Hey, I know somebody in the area there that just recently got saved, and um, I know that you're obedient 
to the faith, hey, new convert, I'd like you to go and I'd like to introduce you to brother so-and-so. He can help you. I have confidence in this guy because he's obedient to the faith. Obedience is very important. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 3, you can just go over there. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay. Which one is more powerful? This nice, sharp, double-edged sword or this? This is far more powerful than this. This thing here can keep the devil away. This can't. Okay, um, this thing here is not going to fight any devil. If there's a devil here somewhere in the room, I can't hit him with this sword and all of a sudden he's screaming and there's some devil blood and he goes running out of the room. This one here I can read from and the devils flee. Um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's why the devil hates this book and he wants to get rid of this book. The devil comes along and he says... Um, Hey, that old King James Bible, that, that thing's no good anymore. Uh, let me take that away from you and give you this more accurate uh, modern version. I'll pick one here if I can see one. I'm trying to find the one that's a popular one nowadays. Well, I'll just go with this silly one here. The Green Bible. <laughs> The New Revised Standard Version isn't that so much nicer than this old, ugly, old black, gold, you know, gilt edge. It's so stereotypical. It's just, it, it's kind of offensive. It, it just, it's kind of preachy and kind of judgmental. And this one here is made out of recycled paper. See, isn't that so much nicer? The devil wants to get rid of your weapon here, your spiritual weapon, your mighty weapon, the Bible says here, and give you this stupid little ridiculous thing here. Okay, this is what you do with one of these things. It's not God's word. Don't worry about it. Verse 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Are your thoughts under control? They should be, because if you, if you don't have your thoughts under control, you can't really say that you're obeying Christ. You need to get your thoughts under control, and that is a struggle. Okay, It is warfare sometimes, especially you go out to a store and they're playing some music that you knew from your lost life, and all of a sudden you're, you start singing along to it in your mind, you go, stop, 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 bring every thought into the captivity and to the obedience of Christ. Okay, Lord, um, give me a good song. Rock of ages, cleft for me. And you start singing it in your mind and, and the music's fighting it. And you're, oh, you know. It's a war. Verse 6. And having, in a readiness to re and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. You belong to Jesus Christ. But look at verse 6. I love this right here. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You know what happens when you obey this book? You get revenge on the way you used to live. And it's a beautiful thing. You know what? I'm going to just tell you something. I'd like to see a lot more bitterness among the body of Christ. Bitterness? Isn't bitterness a bad thing? No, bitterness is actually a very good thing when it's targeted the right way. You know what you should be bitter about? You should be bitter about the Hollywood actors and actresses that messed you up. You should be bitter at the people that posed in the pornography. You should be bitter at the alcohol companies that messed you up and got you drunk. You should be bitter at the pharmaceutical companies that got you on their poisonous drugs and messed up your mind. You should be bitter at the public school systems that told you lies, that told you you came from a monkey, 
that you evolved and that you're getting better and better. When the Bible says that man is not getting better, man is getting worse. Those things, you should be bitter about those things. You should say, I want revenge on that stuff. That, those things out there are hurting people. Public school is child abuse. Alcohol is wicked. Cigarettes give people you know, lung disease and all kinds of things. Just mess up your teeth, mess up your health. They're horrible for you. I want revenge on those things. And how do you get it? Obedience to the Word of God. Wow, my Bible says that what I was doing in my past lost life was is that's a sin. Well, then I'm going to obey this book, which will cause me to disobey what I was doing back there in the past. Having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. Revenge all disobedience. Those things that you did that were contrary to the word of God as a lost person. When your obedience is fulfilled. I mean, talk about a beautiful thing. I'm all about revenge. That's why I tickled so many people off out there. Because I want revenge on the things that messed me up in my past. And you know what one of the big ones was? Church attendance. Oh, Brian was hurt by people in his past and there were churches that did things that were hurtful and so he's bitter now and oh, thank you, sick mind Freud, with your little, you know, psychological, uh, you know, things that you... I am bitter. I am bitter. Because these stinking arrogant people out there with their church buildings, they put it on you like you have a problem if you don't go to church. Why aren't you faithfully attending a local church? Well, because there's no scripture for it. I've seen what the church buildings do to people. I've seen the, the social little gospel that they preach. And before and after service, people are standing there talking about the world. Where's the fighting of sin? Where's the changed life? Where, what are you doing? Oh, there's a brother so-and-so there. He's, he's messing around with another man's wife. And this guy over here, you know, was molesting children, but... They're big tithers in the church, so shh, let's just not let's not disturb the brethren. Let's not get things controversial here and whatever else. And pastors doing some things that are a little bit wrong and a little bit bad, but we have to think about the, the majority of the church people, so let's not make controversy. You know what I want? I want revenge on the church buildings. I'm better about the church buildings. I was disobedient to the word of God when I was going to church. I'll say that again. I was disobedient to God when I was going to church. Our God is not some foolish little boy or whatever else that, oh, I forgot to say go to church in the Bible. That's not God. And all these people with their church buildings, including Peter Ruckman, including any of the, the, the great guys and whatever the past, great guys of the past, they were in disobedience. He knew. He knew. <laughs> He knew. The local church. Go back to the sermon here in just a minute. Trying to find where that one thing was at. I quoted this in one of my videos. He actually says, you know, he goes through the whole thing, how the, you know, the purpose of a church and how to go through it and get this and that and whatever else. Um, I don't have this as part of my study, but he admits it right in this book. Uh, he says here, you are in the eyes of, a, of the community a paid professional. They need a corporate testimony in the town so they cannot rightly be labeled as, labeled as individual nuts. <laughs> you need a corporate testimony in the town by having a church building so that you won't be in, labeled as an individual nut. This from the great Peter Ruckman. All of their giving should be tax exempt. They are entitled to it. Because the Catholics have been getting those benefits for years in a country they are dedicated to destroying. So you should get tax bonuses because the Catholics do. Let 
There's the top one. There you go. Pause it and read it. The people will demand air conditioning and heating. A plan will have to include these. They will need drinking fountains, coat racks, storage rooms, a choir room, a baptistry and a dressing room, public address systems, yard lighting, parking lots, and acoustical padding. You or someone will need an office and probably offices. Chapter and verse. Where's it at in the scriptures? Let's make it plain. Who will you obey? Your uh, godly preacher, the man of God, or the Bible? If you do get pews, make sure they are padded, at least on the bottom. Americans are spoiled rotten, even the saved ones. Right there it is. Designs for church building, auditoriums. In building a new building, the general rule is the new building should be about twice the size of the old building. You can get too optimistic and overbuild. The Local Church by Peter Ruckman. Had a brother email me, and I haven't had a chance to email you back, brother. I'm sorry about that. But saying, should we really be endorsing Peter Ruckman when he was doing things that he knew was sin? I understand. Um, and that's something I need to pray about. Because I get it that people that go to church and things that they, you know, they'll do it ignorantly and they do it, whatever. They're disobeying God by doing it because the Bible never says to go to church. The Bible never said any of this stuff that he has in here. So what do you do? Do you just say, okay, he had some things right, but I have to reject him because he was wrong on the church building thing? It's rough, isn't it? All of a sudden you start to look like an individual nut. Don't you? Kind of happens when you serve the Lord. The closer you get to Jesus Christ, the farther you get away from other people. You don't do this? You don't do that? You didn't vote? Why didn't you vote? Because Donald Trump's a Jesuit and Joe Biden is a papist. Oh, okay. You're one of those. Uh Obedience. Easier said than done. Philemon, chapter 1. Philemon, chapter 1, verse 21. Last time it appears, obedience appears in the Pauline epistles. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. I hope I can have confidence in some of you. I hope you can have confidence in me. That I will be obedient to the word. The live streams that I was doing on Sunday mornings, I had two brethren write to me and say, uh, Brother, um, what are, you are doing is essentially the church building thing. Save and lost coming together. And they brought up some other very good points. And I thought... I can't say anything against it. I have to stop. Okay, putting into the live streams on Sunday mornings. Um, still we'll be doing live streams, but uh, a weekly thing and whatever and prayer requests and lost people asking for prayer. Uh, you don't deserve prayer if you're lost. Okay, you don't deserve prayer. You need to get saved. Um, my prayers for you if you're lost that you help you get better and so you're not sick and get you get a better job and what it, that's a waste of time. You have the best job and the best health and everything else and you die and go to hell. What good were the prayers? I have to be obedient. And when I get convicted about sin, when things are brought up and I say, oh boy, then I have a choice. 
and you have a choice. Will you obey the book that you hold in your hands? It's not about obeying me. You can listen to me and say, oh, Brian's wrong on that, and I can prove it from the Scriptures. Good. This is your authority. But will you obey? Um, oh, yes, brother, and, and we can obey, and we can live as nice Christians. I really hate to tell you, but uh, the times that are coming, it's going to separate the saved from the lost. The uh, dividing lines are getting very big, very big. And you might end up homeless or in prison. You might lose your job. You might uh, get shot, martyred. But it uh, all comes back to you being obedient. I will obey God rather than men. I hope that that's your prayer. Go next to Acts chapter 5. Now that we've looked at all the references to obedience, I'm going to show you two examples of obedience. You're probably familiar with this if you're a Bible believer. You know the stories of the book of Acts very well. Acts chapter 5, one of the great examples of obedience among the saved. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. You know there's religious people that hate you if you're a Bible believer. They can't stand you. They hate my guts. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. They want to put you in prison. We have uh, hate crime laws now. We have uh, other things now that... Uh, we pretend that you have the funny virus and, and um, you need to be quarantined. We need to put you here and there. And, oh, you don't want a vaccine? Well, we're going to have to put you in prison. We're going to have to put you in some place, you know. They want to put you in prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. What if that comes back? Think about it. What would you do? The police show up at your door. They handcuff you. Take you there and they put you into the vehicle and they take you into the prison. They stick you in the prison cell. And all of a sudden, poof, middle of the night, the doors come open and the Lord says, go back and preach. Well, Lord, um, I'm kind of waiting on a call back from my lawyer, and and um, you know I'm kind of in in touch with the Christian uh, law associates, and I'm I'm trying to kind of get into the right you know and you know social media, and they can there's a petition out there to you know free Brian Denlinger, you know and and whatever. Wait a second, Lord, you just you're you're breaking me out of prison, and you want me to go back and do the thing that I got arrested for previously. Lord says, yeah. I mean, you realize how wild that is? Wild to the mind of the average modern Christian? Let's continue. Verse 21. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. They obeyed. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. They got all the ammunition ready. They're ready to go. Go to the prison and bring the prisoners. <laughs> but when the officers came, they found them not in the prison. They re and found them not in the prison. They returned and told, saying, "The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors." But when we had opened, we found no man within. You think the Lord could perform that miracle again? Or was it just limited to the first century? The Lord could help you to escape and they wouldn't even know it. I firmly believe that. Verse 24. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. <laughs> Damage control. Oh no, what if the people hear about this? This could make us look really bad. Oh. Amazing what 
obedience to the scriptures does to the lost world. Amazing when the Lord breaks somebody out like that and says, go back and preach. And the lost world's there biting their fingernails. I mean, these are the guys in authority, the religious leaders, the rulers, and they're saying, oh, what's going to happen if people find out about this? <gasps> they're frightened. Why? By a bunch of obedient Christians being broken out of jail by the Lord. Hmm. Verse 25, Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. Obedient Christians had it at such a level where the people are there and they're saying, Wow, preach to us. We want to hear this. And the political rulers, the police of the day, the soldiers, they're coming out and they're saying, oh, Could you please come with us? We just, just for a moment, everybody, everybody just excuse us. We just need to talk to them a little bit because they're so afraid of the people out there. They're afraid of the public because the public is glorifying the Lord because of the obedience of a few Christians. Verse 27, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? We have laws, don't you know? <laughs> and behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Oh, the irony of it. <laughs> then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. I'm not wearing a mask. Why? I need to obey God rather than men. Um, we're here to give you the vaccine. I'm not taking the vaccine. I trust my Lord can keep me healthy and he can heal me of any sickness that's out there. And he gives me the wisdom to live in good nutritional health so I don't even get sick from this virus thing. I'm going to obey God rather than men. But you don't understand. It's Operation Warp Speed. We're here. We have the military. We're, we're going to give you this thing. I'm going to obey God rather than men. Sorry. And he continues. Verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey Him. I want the Holy Ghost in my life. I want the power of the Holy Spirit of God in my life. Okay, how do you get it? Obey. Do what God tells you to do. The Bible says I'm supposed to go out and work. Man says I'm not allowed to because of uh, some stupid nonsense pandemic that has been created from the, the workings of Satan coming out and you can't go to work. You can't go out here. You can't go do this. You can't go do that. Nuts to you. And if you put me in prison, the Lord can break me out and I'll go back out and tell people about it and cause you, the politicians, to fear. How dare you lock this country down? How dare you violate the scriptures? I will obey my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't care what your laws say. If they contradict the word of God, I'll go with the word of God. We ought to obey God rather than men. But brother, I could lose this and I could lose that. And the Lord can give them back. The Lord can protect you. Are you going to obey the faith? Or are you just going to pretend? See, again, the little church building, little stupid little church buildings. Or you can go there and you can, I'm, I'm a member of First Baptist Church. I'm a big bold. And, Amen, brother. Preach it, brother. Amen. Hide in your little church building with all the little people out there. Or you can go out and you can live like a real Christian. 
Oh, that's that weird guy again and his weird wife and their weird little boy and things. And oh, look at the weird things that they put on their vehicles and the, they, they don't do this and they don't do that. And there was a, you know, they, they walk through the store and there's a rock song on. I see his wife going like this, you know, and just, oh, this is so vexing. I hate this stupid music. Well, they're so weird. That's the way the world thinks about us. If you're saved, they think that same stuff about you. Your relatives cast out your name as evil. Oh, it's so sad to see them getting so involved in this cult stuff. And, oh, it's just so terrible to, to think that they, they were once so neat back when they were lost. And now they got into this religious stuff and they're, they're such weirdo. That's what they think about you. And there's no way to reconcile it. You can't reconcile lost people and saved people living together. We're, we're enemies. We're separate. There is no compromise. You might have to work with them. You might have to be around them. But I'm going to obey Jesus Christ. You obey the devil. Oh, we passed a law. You go come out here and go get vaccinated. Here's a sign. There's the military. They're coming around door to door. Sorry. I'll obey God rather than men. I'm going to come to the front door with my sword in my hand and say, I'm obeying God and not you. I'm not going to do it. Life of the flesh is in the blood. I'm not going to let you put things that are going to get into my bloodstream that are poisonous. You won't kill me. You won't kill my wife. You won't kill my son. Not happening. It's not happening. Well, sir, I'm, I'm afraid that we've passed law. I don't care about your laws. I don't care. Well, sir, you're violating some things by saying what you're saying on YouTube right now. Fine. Then shut me down and let God destroy your home. May the wrath of God fall upon you. I'll obey God rather than men. We need a call to obedience. We need to not care what people think about us, what happens to us. You lose your job as a result of your obedience to the Word of God. Don't you think God can provide for you? Don't you think God can take care of you and give you some other way? You're a Christian business owner and the government comes along and they say, hey, shut your business down again. Well, I better, I better obey them. No, you better obey the scriptures that say that you're supposed to provide for your own. You're supposed to work. I'm keeping my shop open. I don't care what you say, government. I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the government said that we have to go out and cut our three of our toes off. Okay, kids, let's go on out. We got to cut three of our toes off because there was a law passed. We need to destroy ourselves financially because they passed a law and we can't go to work. No. No, it's not happening. We need a call to obedience, brethren. Finally, let's go to Joshua. Back to the Old Testament. One of the most beautiful statements in the entire King James Bible. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua was a real man. I think if I remember correctly, there were only three men that never lost a battle when they were in charge. Joshua, King David, and Oliver Cromwell. Joshua chapter 24, verse 14 through 15. Now therefore, fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. Put away the gods that you've served in your past life. What's a god? A god is what gets your affection. It's what you think about. You know, the desire of your heart is your god. Put away those gods. The new sports cars and the, and the sport uh, athletes and football and baseball and basketball. Those are gods. Put those things away. Your video games. They're at the altar of your video games playing for hours. Put them away. Get rid of those false gods. Your alcohol, your cigarettes, your drugs, your pornography. Get rid of those false gods and serve the Lord. Verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. You have a choice to make. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but... Why do I need to think about what my local church members are doing? What's everybody saying? What's the consensus? What's the majority thought? What are people doing and what should we do? That's not it. 
But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Period. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will be obedient to this book. I don't care what you say. I don't want, care what laws are passed. Well, today is election day, selection day. <laughs> um, what, well, who's going to win, Biden or Trump? Who's going to be in? I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Why? Because my, my uh, rules, my orders remain the same no matter who gets in. Well, Joe Biden's going to come in and he's going to bring in liberal, liberal communism. Okay, then I'll disobey it. Well, Donald Trump's going to come in and he's going to bring in right-wing fascism. Then I'll disobey it. Why? Because if I obey them, I'm not obeying the Bible. You get it? Well, they're going to lock down the country again. You're not going to be able to drive on the road. Sorry, not happening. I didn't obey it the first time. I'm not going to obey it this time. If I need to get out there and get food for my family, I'm going to get out and I'm going to get food for my family. Period. You know, I, I said to my wife jokingly, I said, you know, I wish I had a church building. <laughs> They're not in the Bible, but just to prove a point here, I wish I had a church building just so I could say, I'm keeping it open and I don't care what laws you pass. doesn't matter to me. Hey, people that want to come, come to the church. If I had a business someplace, I'd keep the doors open. Some government official comes along. You can't have your, your, your business open. <laughs> I don't care. I'm going to have it open. Because if I close it, it's contradicting the Word of God. And this whole coronavirus thing is a scam. It's not dangerous. They're just constantly changing the numbers. It's an opposition of science falsely so-called is what it is. The whole thing's a stinking scam. And I'm not afraid to say it publicly. Put my face out there. Name's Brian Denlinger. Here we are, ministry office in Patton, Maine. I don't hide behind the doors of my little church building and, and just kind of have my little crew there, that my little cheerleading crew here, and, and I give you pulpit mentions and you give me the little rah, 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 you know, little cheer me on and things. Amen, preacher, preach it. Uh, uh, no. I am what I am. And I will obey the Lord Jesus. And there's been plenty of times, brethren, that I haven't obeyed Him. And I'm ashamed to say that. There's been times the Lord has opened a door for me to witness and I didn't witness. I got cowardly. What should I do? Should I quit as a result? Or should I double down and say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. I don't want that ever to happen again. I'm going to try better next time. I'm going to learn your word more. I'm going to hide your word in my heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what you do. You're going to mess up as a Christian. You will never be sinlessly perfect. Ever. But you know what? If you always want to obey the word, you're going to get better and stronger as time goes by. And your fear of man is going to diminish and diminish and diminish. The more you lift this Bible up, the more your fear goes down. It's like the scales, you know? You get saved, it's like this. You got a whole lot of sins and a whole lot of issues that you have. But you start to magnify that book and you start to bring that book up and those sins start to go away and they start to get less and less and you get more victory and more victory over those sins and down the sin scale goes. Why? Because you're obedient. I want to obey God. I want to obey His Word. I pray you take heed to what I'm saying. We need a call to obedience, brethren. And so much the more as time goes by. Um, you might go to prison. I mean, there have been evil things that have been happening and I realize that there are some of the brethren and you've been in this city for so long and whatever, and it's tough. It's tough for you. I saw a lot of this evil stuff coming and I said, you know, I think I'm going to leave. Uh, I think I'm going to get out in the middle of nowhere so I don't have to deal with as much wickedness and sin. Um, you say, well, I can't get out. I get it. I understand. Um, you're going to have a lot more that you're going, you know, going to have to fight than me. Um, I can go to most stores in my area and there's no face mask requirement. And I've yet to wear one. And I won't wear one because they're trying to tell me to do something that's contrary to the scriptures. You say, well, brother, I, between you and God, I don't care. Whatever. 
Um, but when you wear a face mask, uh, you're going to have a harder time coming out and saying, I'm not taking the vaccine. Well, you took, you wore the face mask. You admitted that there's a danger and it's the world's dangerous enough that you had a face mask on. Now you won't take the vaccine. Hey, if you uh, don't take the vaccine, we're going to have to lock up your bank account. What are you going to do? Obey. Obey. God help you. So that's going to be it, and we'll see you in the next study. Thank you for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.